Great job, you guys. Amen. I got caught up in singing and about 30 seconds ago realized I did not have a microphone turned on at all. So I had to go hurry up and get that. How is everybody? So I got a question for you. Um, What do you think these people have in common? Miley Cyrus, Oprah Winfrey, I could stop there and you guys would have some funny answers. Okay. Um, Stephen Colbert, two of the Kardashian sisters, um, Adele, and singer Missy Elliott. Anybody idea of what they have in common? All of them suffer from anxiety disorders, every one of them, in various different ways. Um, Stephen Colbert talks about how when he was in his 20s uh, in a... In a uh, in Rolling Stone magazine, he talks about the fact that um, he learned that by creating things and by being funny, he could try and escape the anxiety that he felt. My favorite story was that Adele says that one time at a show in Amsterdam, she climbed out of the building through a fire escape to escape having to go on stage. That was Adele. You guys know Adele, right? Do I need to sing some of her stuff in order to remind you of who Adele is? No. Stephanie's over here like, yeah, you should. No, no, I won't. Uh, Missy Elliott in 2015 was performing at the Super Bowl at the halftime show, and she had an anxiety attack right beforehand. And uh, she's a woman of faith. She says it was only by the grace of God and people praying for her that she was able to actually move forward with that performance. Um, I want to talk to you today about specifically this idea of anxiety, because Especially prior to, uh, prior to COVID, uh, anxiety oftentimes carried a bit of a stigma with it where people were uh, somewhat ashamed to or didn't want to talk about it. Uh, COVID hit and then all of us realized we all have an anxiety disorder. We, we, all, we all struggle with this in various different ways. There are things that make us highly uncomfortable. Last night, uh, I went to a friend of mine's birthday party. It was a big event, lots of people. And uh, it was, it, I had two or three neighbors. They wanted to go with me. We went, we walk in, there, there's band playing, there's music everywhere. And we stayed about 20 minutes and two of my neighbor guys, buddies who went with me came and said, hey, I don't know these people. Uh, I, I don't know all this music. Uh, I'm ready to go home. Like, I'm just really not interested in this. So we, we bailed and we went back home and it was, it was over. And we talked later and it was just this feeling of anxiety that can come from new experiences and new people and new moments and crowds and all of the things that can happen in our lives when we, when we don't necessarily expect them to happen. Uh, We're going to deal specifically today with some things from the scriptures that might help us. We've been walking through Psalm 23, one of the most famous passages of scripture in all the Bible. We're doing it one verse at a time. And this verse is the third verse today. It says, the good shepherd, he restores my soul. Um, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but the Hebrew word for soul here is a really interesting word. Uh, After some study, it actually means breath of life. So the idea that 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 the, the person writing this, David would have said, when I can't breathe, he helps me have my breath. That's, that's what he's getting. When I, when I feel like I, I can't move or go on, he gives me the peace. He restores my life breath, my, my soul. Uh, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The, the, the visual there is of a sheep that is scared stiff not sure what to do next, and the good shepherd walks him through the path, just helping him get where he needs to be, not only the path of righteousness, but also the path for the sake of the shepherd's ultimate goals in life. This is a passage that we'll look at multiple times today as we think through this. Uh, And ultimately, our theme for the whole series is this, when it's time for a recharge, Uh, We need to return to the one who's in charge. When we find ourselves at the end of our strength, at the end of whatever reserve we had, it's the reason we find ourselves anxious, scared, lonely, is that this is the reminder for us to return to him. Let's pray together today and we will do just that. Lord, help us today see you. Help us sense and know and feel your presence. Lord, it is our pleasure to follow you, 
But even beyond that, Lord, it is our weakness that needs you. Help us today to draw closer to you. Draw us toward you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Did you know that mental and emotional issues are often connected to your stomach? I had no idea. I had no idea that, that the things going on in your gut are one of the things that are affecting the way that you feel. This was just a, a real surprise to me as I was studying through this. In fact, um, this professor, Joe Bosch, he, he made this quote in one of the scientific journals. He says, 10 years ago, and this was written two years ago, so say 12 years ago now. Uh, he says, 10 years ago, if you had said that there was something linking depression and the microbiome, okay, that's a big word right there. I, did, I had to Google that one, okay? The, we're talking about the microscopic things that exist in your gut, the microbiome. If you want to use that word in normal conversation just to seem very intelligent, you go right ahead. Just know that your pastor had to Google that one, okay? Uh, microbiome. He said, he said, back then, 10 years ago, 12 years ago now, if you had suggested that there was a connection between the two, you would have been carried out with a straitjacket, which I thought was an odd comment for someone who studies mental health issues to make. But that's what, that's what he said, okay? That's what he said. And now he says, now absolutely, it's very clear that there is a link. Now, I thought this was interesting, and it's not a big part of today's message, but I thought it was interesting that in the Old Testament specifically, that God has so much interest in what people eat. I always thought that was strange. Like, why, why does God care what kind of meat that you eat or how often you have vegetables or those kinds of things? But isn't it interesting that our emotional, spiritual, mental health is also connected to the food that goes through our bodies and to what's going on internally in us? It brings a whole new meaning to the idea of eating your feelings, doesn't it? When you start thinking, oh, why do I run to those particular foods, we like to call them comfort foods, when I'm not comfortable? And, and then the bigger question is, do they really help? Or is it just a quick kind of download of emotions and then they all come back again tomorrow? It's the kind of thing that happens. Our bodies, our souls, our minds are so heavily connected in the reality of who we are that everything affects everything in various different ways. We're going to experience a lot of that today. Ultimately, we find out this truth. Only the good shepherd can satisfy the hunger and the thirst of our souls. There are so many other things that we can try to use to momentarily satisfy those issues and those hungers. But only the good shepherd ultimately satisfies those things. Let me tell you a story from John 21. I was going to read all this. I thought it would be better just to share it with you. This is the final chapter of the book of John. Jesus has already been to the cross. He's already died on the cross. He's already gone into the grave. He has now resurrected, and he's now introducing himself back to his followers. Now, some of them were fishermen before Jesus called them to be disciples and then apostles. And so what they've done with their this depression, anxiety, frustration of losing Jesus on the cross in their mind, he has died in their mind. They've decided to go back to work, so they are fishing again. Jesus walks up to the edge of the water. Simon Peter and others are on the boat. They're fishing. And Jesus notices that they've been tossing these nets, pulling them back, tossing them, pulling them back. No fish at all. And so Jesus shouts out, you should toss your net on the other side of the boat. Try that. Try that, okay? And they do. And it says that they pull in a, a net full of, of fish. Now, at this point in the story, they still don't recognize that this is Jesus, okay? They don't know that this is Jesus. Um, and then they ultimately start to pull in and realize how many fish they have, and they offer fish to him. Their eyes are somewhat opened, and they realize that this is the Christ. He is alive. He is, he's, he's been raised again. He's not dead. And so we ask the question then is, is, is what's going on with this daily filling? Only the good shepherd not only can handle our hunger and our thirst for righteousness, but only the good shepherd can fill us on a daily basis. Only he can do that. Let me just get personal with you. I don't know about you, but 
Sometimes my worst days are the day after my best day. Have you else ever felt that before? It's weird, isn't it? Like, like sometimes emotionally, spiritually, uh, those kinds of things, sometimes you would think, this high I'm on, this good news I got, this, this finish line that I crossed, like this goal that I accomplished, whatever it is, you would think that it's going to be so good that this, will, this has me level for months, you would think. It doesn't really work that way for us as human beings. We need daily filling, not momentary or, you know, like regional calendar feeling, filling. It's not that we can have something on a Friday and we're good till a week from Thursday, right? Like we're not, it doesn't work like that. Sometimes all of the good that comes from some sort of major positive thing that's happened in our life is soaked up and used in the moment. And the next day we're like, oh, well, that's over. You know, maybe you've heard the speech. There's a very famous high school graduation speech from a valedictorian. He's a young man. And he said, in second or third grade, I decided that I was going to be the valedictorian of my class. And so I worked hard. I gave it everything that I had. I did my very best in every class. I took the teachers that I thought were the best teachers. I took the classes that I thought I would be best at. And at the end of the day, I made all A's in all classes upper 90s in nearly every, cl- every class, and I knew when they named a valedictorian, it would be me. And I thought that that would be enough to have me feeling great about myself for years and years. He said it felt wonderful standing at that big banquet when they called out the name of this class's valedictorian, and I got to stand up. And he said, here's what's crazy. It felt amazing for 12 minutes. And after 12 minutes, they had moved on. They were talking about other things. Nobody cared anymore about who was the valedictorian. And I started asking myself the question, what's next? And I had no idea. No idea what was next. My mind and my heart and soul filled with anxiety I started worrying that there was no other way that I could ever top this. Maybe I had reached my peak and it was over. That's what went through his mind. You see, walking with the Lord is not just about meeting Jesus at a certain time in our life and that guaranteeing that we will go to heaven. And then in some way he goes, yep, the rest of your life is going to be wonderful. Enjoy. It's not like that at all. Meeting Jesus does begin with this grace on our life and faith from us where we begin to realize that he's the one who has saved us, is saving us, and will save us. But that will save us part means that he is filling us daily. Means that we have a relationship to have with him daily. And just like the disciples were standing in a boat fishing and catching nothing, they needed Jesus in their moment in that life to once again instruct and direct them so that their life could be filled again today. You wonder why I push hard to try to get as many of the people at Woodlawn as possible reading the Bible on a daily basis? It's because I know this. I know that you and I, we don't need momentary fillings of the Holy Spirit. We need a connection with Jesus that happens every day. And quite frankly, it's more than every day. It's continual moments throughout every day where we're, we're recognizing him, we're listening to him, we're interested in him, and he is filling us daily. In the story, they actually announce how many fish. This is an interesting thing. There were 153 fish in the nets. Now, this has caused theologians to ponder for a long time. Why 153 fish? There was a first century theologian who said, well... There were 153 different kinds of fish in that lake. And Jesus led them to catch one of each. I have no idea if that's true. (laughs) I couldn't find anything other than that one guy's quote to have any substantiation on whether or not there were 153 different species of fish. It's a really interesting idea. And let me tell you something. If you convince yourself it's definitely true, that will preach That's a pastor's way of saying you could really motivate people with that. If you wanted to say he's going to catch at least one of everybody, that kind of thing. 
I don't really think that's what it means. Jerome is the one who said that. I don't know that Jerome was right. The second idea or thought is that, believe it or not, you know, they're in a Greek world, they're, the Pythagoras and other, you know, other uh, Aristotle and other thinkers were out there. If you take all of the Greek letters in the sentence leading up to the catching of the fish and you give them their numeric value and you add it all together, it comes to 153. Now, does that matter? I have no idea. I have no idea if that matters or not. Some theologians have said the number 153 was about impressing the Pythagorean thinkers of the day, and they would have thought it was really cool that your words and your numbers all came together and made up to the same number. So maybe, maybe that's true, maybe that's not. Can I just give you the fisherman's answer why I think they counted? I've never been fishing when we caught a lot of fish and didn't count them. Like every time, like, like, you know what I mean? Like, like we want to go home and go, I caught 12 fish this, this big today. We don't want to go, I caught some. No, no, 12. And we want to compare that as a fisherman to the last time we went when we caught eight, because today was better. We caught 12. And in the future, we want the goal to be 13, right? And then 14, and then 18, and then 24. And so my guess, and this is just your pastor, Brad, who likes to go fishing, guessing, I think they counted because they were amazed. Like, oh my gosh, we have never caught 153 fish in the net at one time ever before in history. This is a, this is a big deal. So they bring that out, okay? They bring that out, and they count, and they're excited. They're thrilled about the moment. And we learn from that this, that only the good shepherd can lead to daily places of fullness. Here's what I mean. When you live a life like I have, where you get to one goal and you're excited about that goal and you kind of hope that the good feelings that you have from that, that win, that success are going to continue on. And then you get to the next day or the day after that, or a few days later, and you realize that's over. Those feelings are gone. I need something else to keep myself motivated and excited and focused. Uh, you begin to realize that it's not the experiences of our life that keep us fulfilled. It's the one whom we're following and who knows us and who loves us who keeps us fulfilled. Now, here's what's pretty awesome about that. If you, if you try to live the way I tried to live, which was I can only feel good on the days when I have a success I can think about, right? A thing I accomplished, then, then what ends up happening is you better have a lot of successes or you're gonna have a lot of sad days, right? Um, but when you realize that, wait a second, I don't have to be successful at something today in order for the presence of God to be in my life today. And if the presence of God in my life is what brings fulfillment to me today, then I don't have to have a big success today in order to experience fulfillment today. Does that make sense? See, only the good shepherd can lead to daily places of fullness. And isn't that something that we want? To be full today and tomorrow and the next day to, to experience fulfillment and contentment in life where, where we're not battered and beaten down by anxiety and depression and other negative feelings, but we are fulfilled and encouraged and, and joyous about the life we're living and the days we are living in that life. Only the good shepherd can lead to daily places of fulfillment. Um, we're going to try something. This is going to be the weirdest, the, like the weirdest thing I've asked you to do. All right? Would everybody stand with me? Just for just stand up. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I'm not bringing anybody on stage. Okay. Um, the scripture guides us to be grounded is another word that gets used pretty often, and, and even among uh, counselors and therapists and others, the idea of kind of experiencing a grounded life where you, where you really know where you stand and know where you are so that when you face other things, uh, you, know, you know how to face them. Uh, I'm going to read some scripture in a minute that, that kind of guides us to intentionally think about things, intentionally think about specific things. So I'm going to ask you to intentionally think about some things. Here, here, it's this simple, okay? 
Everybody quiet, everybody silent. You can have your eyes open or closed, whatever you'd like. I want you personally, internally in your mind, I want you to think of five things that you can see with your eyes that are lovely. Five things. It doesn't have to be in this room necessarily. Things that you can see with your eyes that are lovely. Count those off. I'll give you a moment. Five things you can see with your eyes that are lovely, beautiful. How about four things that you can feel that are true? Think about something you could touch that it's that's real. It's true. It's genuine. How about three things that you can hear with your ears that are praiseworthy? And you could just go, the three different people who were on stage leading us in worship this morning, like Jody and Kim and Todd, that would be the easy one. But think about three things that you can hear that are worthy of giving God praise because of. Think of two things that you can smell with your nose that are pure, that are good, appetizing. And now I'm going to have to speed the sermon up because I'm about to give you something to think about for lunch. Think of some one thing that you can taste that's just excellent. Okay, you can be seated. I'm going to help you with that last part because we have a gift for everybody today before you go home. We have Kirchhoff's cookies for everybody in the room. Okay, that should have gotten a better response than that. I'm going to give you another chance, okay? These, these cookies are more than a dollar a piece, okay? This is a good cookie, all right? So I'm going to give you guys all Kirchhoff's cookies before you go home today. That's right. There you go. We got milk to go with them. It's going to be a good, it's going to be a good moment, okay? That's at the end of today's gathering. Um, what we're trying to learn here is to ground ourselves in, in God's ways, to intentionally think about, feel, smell, hear, and see the things of God. Because if you don't watch out, you will think about, feel, see, hear, and smell all the things that are wrong. My family loves to camp. We have a camper. It's, uh, it's not fancy, but in the world of camping, it's probably more glamping than camping. Like, there's no tent involved, you know, and we have Wi-Fi. Like, that, that's that kind of camping, okay? Uh, I have a couple of jobs that nobody else is willing to do. One of them is to utilize something that we call the blue boy. Anybody know what a blue boy is? They have other names, some of their names maybe not be something. One of them, I'm not even going to say it. That they uh, Taking the blue boy to do what you do with the blue boy is often referred to as the ride of shame. The blue boy is the thing you use when your camper is not parked at a site with a sewer system. And yet you still have to do something with what is known as the black water. You guys following me with this? Okay. I want you to understand that when I'm doing that, I got gloves on my oldest, nastiest clothes, my shoes that I do not intend to wear anywhere else, you know, and I'm doing that job because I'm a good father and a loving husband, and Stephanie said so. So I'm doing it, and I take care of that. I want you to know something. You have to intentionally think about something that smells great. 
when you are handling the blue boy. Or you will have a horrible day all day long and be angry at everyone who has utilized the bathroom in that camper for the last two days, right? The truth is, sometimes in life, we all have blue boy jobs to do where we have to intentionally think about the things that are praiseworthy and pure and lovely and good, or we will just smell the day, see the day, think about the day, feel the day. You see what I'm getting at? This is why the scripture tells us in Philippians, the apostle Paul writes to us, listen to this. He says, finally, brothers, that, that, that word finally doesn't just mean that he's ending his conversation. It means that he's laying down for us a uh, foundational thought, okay? At the bottom of all that I've said to you in a letter that's all about being joyous and rejoicing. He says, finally, brother, whatever is true, if you guys would out loud, say the third word each time, the, the, word, the word that has real meaning. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. Ah, there's one more. If there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. This is an intentionality. Like, like give yourself purpose of thinking about these things. What that means is that in life, you and I are going to have moments where we are not thinking about those things. We are thinking about other things and we go, stop, Wait a second. Lovely, pure, honorable, commendable, excellent, praiseworthy. Like, find me one, Lord. Help me think about that. And all of a sudden, what you'll be amazed by is that the Lord will touch your spirit, and kind of increase your encouragement, and take you to a better place. In Philippians, he goes on to say in the next verse, he says, whatever you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul says, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. He's giving us a bit of a, of a, um, uh, a paradigm as to how we ensure this noticeable presence of the Spirit of God in our life. In other words, here's what we can't do. We can't go, I'm a Christian I prayed and I received Jesus and I got baptized and I go to church, but now I'm going to like focus all my attention on the negative, stinky, rotten, frustrating things of my world. And I'm going to wonder why Jesus doesn't bring me peace. I think the scripture is telling us you're not going to experience peace if you focus your attention on the things that are not peaceful. You're not going to experience peace if you allow yourself to be dominated by that which robs you of peace. You're not going to have that. And so there's an intentionality here of going, whatever is peaceful, whatever is true, whatever is just, I'm going to think about those things. I want to think about things that are beautiful. I want to think about, and this is what the enemy does to us. Listen, the enemy tries to take our mind to where things that are beautiful become something that we covet or lust after. So now we go, well, I can't look at something beautiful because it brings about sin in my life. So I got to run away from beauty and try to think about things that aren't beautiful. <laughs> like, no, if you, if you keep those things level and solid in your life, then you can look at something that's beautiful. Like uh, my favorite phrase, by the way, I tell my kids this all the time, is that we have to learn how to admire without having to acquire. Okay, so for instance, there is a particular color that Chevrolet is painting their four by four, three quarter ton trucks right now that I think make them maybe the coolest three quarter ton four wheel drive trucks I've ever seen in my life. I see one about once a month and I admire it. And in 25 years, I will be able to afford one of those. I, I plan on it. So I'm, I'm praying for somebody not to scratch that paint job because it is gorgeous, okay? Uh, admire without having to acquire. That, that You don't have to go get it. You don't have to spend a bunch of money. You don't have to lust after it or covet it. You don't have to do that, but you can go, man, that is beautiful. That is sharp. I like that. That's great, okay? That's what the Lord is telling us to do is to have this mindset and guidance where we think about the things that draw our attention to him because when we draw our attention to him, then he fills us with the things that bring us peace. That's how it works. It's that simple and that direct. So we ground ourselves in God's love for other people as we think about the beauty and the joy that comes from their lives as well as ours. 
Psalm 23, 3 again, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Man, it's good to have the Lord in your life and be a part of your daily walk with him. As the story ends in the 21st chapter of John, Jesus looks directly at Simon Peter and asks him, do you love me? And Simon Peter says, yeah. And three times in a row, Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Simon Peter's frustrated by this. Like, what are you talking about? I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. I, I love you. Feed my sheep. I love you. Feed my sheep. I, it's, it's not just my best guess, but I think what scholars think is that Jesus is not reminding him of his failure with the three denials of Christ, but Jesus is restoring him from his failure of the three denials of Christ. He's saying, Simon Peter, three times in a row, you and I don't know who Jesus is. I want nothing to do with him. And now I'm telling you, uh, I, you're forgiven. We can move forward. Here's what you need to do. Feed my sheep. Take care of my people. In other words, he's telling Simon Peter, and then I think all of us, that one of the greatest ways that we live life and one of the greatest ways that we stay positive and one of the greatest ways that we find peace is not only that we're dealing with our own selves, keeping our minds straight and our head in the right place and thinking about the right thoughts, but that we're actually concerned about other people, like genuinely concerned about them. Okay, I'm gonna get like super honest with you for a second. How many of you like me sometimes think other people are stupid. <laughs> like, okay, like, okay, so what I, mean, what I mean is sometimes you see somebody do something and you go, like, what? I'll do it one more time for those in the back, okay? Like, what, what was that? Okay, so here's the tendency. The tendency is to see something that seems wrong, and then think to yourself, well, I would never do that. And then the real tendency is to then devalue that person because of this decision that you believe is a bad one. And y'all are smart people. It probably is a bad one. Just going to guess, okay? The challenge is to recognize that part of the way I walk with the Lord is not to notice someone in the wrong and think down on them because of it. But it's actually to recognize, wait a second, that's a sheep who needs to be fed. That, that's a sheep that might be hungry. That's a sheep that might be malnourished. There's something going on here. How can I, and I don't mean to say that you should jump right into the life of everybody you ever see do something dumb. That's not what I'm saying. But the overall attitude is that we would be people who when we see people in need, we, we, we are concerned about them and not just in judgment of them. But recognize that there's gotta be a way that I can help this person. Make sense? So as I kind of close out, and this, and this is a short sermon because I got more to come in the future, there's a reason I'm giving you cookies later, okay? Uh, we'll buy a little bit of your time. Uh, today, one of our own uh, is not with us, actually an entire family is not with us today because uh, one of our own, and I have his permission to share with you, uh, you guys have met Jonah Parks. Jonah is a, going to be a senior in high school this year. Uh, Jonah's father, Jason Parks, passed away. During COVID, it's been very challenging for the family. His mom, Tresa, who many of you know, is, you know, she has four kids and lost her husband uh, in October, will be two years ago. Um, and so Jonah has needed some help dealing with that trauma. He struggled, okay? Sometimes Jonah has done some things that would make adults around him be frustrated with him. If you have been in authority with Jonah, there have been times when Todd's like, yep, okay? So what happens when we hurt? It's what happens when we're struggling. We don't quite know how to behave, okay? So Jonah has been awarded a scholarship to be a part of... Jonah loves the military, by the way. He wants to go in the army. He's a tough guy, okay? Jonah has been awarded a scholarship to attend uh, a high school that is on base at Fort Knox. And for the next five and a half to six months, he will be there. The colonel told him, don't bring your phone. Just leave it at home. You're not going to need a phone here. Uh, his only way of communicating with us is handwritten letters mailed with a stamp. Can you imagine doing that to a 17-year-old kid today? 
handwritten letters mailed with a stamp, okay? Uh, this is uh, scary for him. He's intimidated. He came and stayed with Stephanie and I and the boys for a few days this week. Uh, I got to spend a lot of man time with him. Uh, he, he, he got to learn how to shoot a rifle with a scope and different things like that. It was kind of, it was kind of a fun week for me and for him. Um, and what I'm telling you is this. You could look at a young man who's struggling and just go, what's wrong with this young man? Or you could look at a young man who's struggling and say, man, how can we help him? How can we help him? And that's what we're doing. So next week, I'm going to give you an email address where if you'd like to email him something encouragement, he can read an email, he just can't send them, okay? So you, you don't have to handwrite anything. <laughs> Not handing out stamps, although you could if you want to. Uh, you'll be able to mail him or email him. And I just think it might be nice if we as a church take an opportunity to feed this sheep, Okay? We're just going to feed the sheep. We're going to encourage him. It's going to be tough. He's going to have to stay. He's on his own. He's not there because a judge made him go or something. He's there because he wants to be. And so that means he also has the ability to decide he doesn't want to be. Okay? So we, don't want, we want to have, help him succeed at this. So this is an area where you get to say, you know what? I love this young man. I want to encourage him. And I'll make sure and give you opportunities to do that. All right? Let's do this. Let's pray together. Jody, would you lead us? You guys lead us in worship. We're going to sing a couple of songs, and then I'm going to come back at the end with a, kind of a big announcement for you guys. Let's pray. Lord, we trust you. We love you. We're, we're excited, Lord, about learning how to live life with you in such a way that it does reduce our emotional trauma, that it helps us deal with anxiety. Lord, you help us deal with depression or sadness or, or various different things. Uh, worries in some way. Lord, we want to learn how to be intentional about grounding ourselves in you and grounding ourselves in uh, concern and care for other people. We want to be intentional, Lord, in thinking about the things you've told us to think about because we know that this helps lead us to this life that's filled with joy and hope and peace and ultimately filled with you. Lord, we trust you. Today is a day where we take our thoughts and our minds and this moment, Lord, we focus on you. As we worship you, Lord, uh, be lifted up among us. But also, Lord, I pray that you, I ask that you would lift up others who may be feeling down today. Others who may be struggling, others who may in some way be um, nervous or scared or maybe feeling lonely or isolated. Lord, I pray that today would be a, a, a day and right now would be a moment when you help them feel even more so a part of this and a part of you. We trust you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me?